Hello, this is a PowerPoint on how to use your camera more effectively to take photographs that are more powerful and will culminate in a assignment where you have to submit five photographs. I wanted to start with SLR cameras. SLR stands for single lens reflex. These are the cameras that have lenses where you control the focus yourself as opposed to a point and shoot camera. Nowadays we have DSLR cameras, digital single lens reflex. They don't have manual, they do still have manual focusing, but you used to see this circle where you had to focus I'm not quite sure it does that anymore because now you can see the screen. But all SLR cameras, other than the manual focusing, you have a lot of control. You have control over your shutter speed. You have control over your aperture or your f-stop. You have control over your light exposure. But you also, with digital cameras nowadays, have control over different settings and a lot of other interesting things that I'll go through today. If you don't have an SLR camera, don't worry. I have a Nikon Coolpix and majority of these photos I'm going to show you today are taken with that. There are a lot of tricks you can do using a point and shoot, a digital camera. Even your phone has some of these options. So we'll talk about them today. So these are the three main things that a standard SLR camera has that allows you to have a lot of options. So the first one, and the most difficult one for people to understand, I'll explain a little bit better in another slide, is the aperture or the f-stop. So it's called an f-stop because it's f1, f2, f3, f4. And that number is how much light gets in and how close the thing you're focusing. So f1 is basically like one meter away. You're only catching the light from the things that are really close. Everything else is blurry, but it's more light. A lot of light is coming in. Whereas a high number is a smaller opening, less light's coming in, but that's a large number because it's focusing on something far, far away. So the light from very far is coming, all the light from everywhere. So I'll explain it better in another slide. In the meantime, the second thing that you play with in an SLR camera is your sh shutter speed. So a low number lets in a lot of light. Your shutter speed is open for a long time. And a high number is very fast. It's letting in very little light. So the idea here in back in an oldie time camera with film, you would leave that shutter open and allow a lot of light to hit that film and expose. So you could overexpose your film. And if it was dark out, you would need to leave your shutter speed open longer to get more light in. And if you have a, if it's really bright out, you want a faster shutter speed because you don't want to overexpose and you can get very fast movements frozen in time with a fast shutter speed. So we'll discuss some of the tricks you can play around with shutter speed and get some really neat effects. And the last thing that's worth mentioning is light meter. You can change your light meter and change how under or overexposed your photos are by telling your camera that no, it's actually quite dark or yes, it's very bright out. And there are different tricks you can play on modern point and shoot cameras that can allow you to do some pretty neat effects with your light meter. So the depth of field, this is your f-stop. This is what I was trying to explain. The lower the number is because it's only focusing on something really close. So that's a shallow depth of focus. But when you have a larger f-stop, it's a larger depth of focus, which is why it's an f-stop focus, um, depth of field for field as well. Um, you have more things in focus, a larger number. So 
this is a series of videos done by the Frogman. He's an internet personality. But they really, to me, explain what depth of field, depth of focus stands for. So with an f-stop of 1.8, only the thing that's within a meter that's really close is in focus. So this little Indiana Jones golden statue here. You can't see what's in the background. But as we make that depth of field larger, we start seeing things further away from the camera, you can now kind of make out that there's something actually written on that white screen in the background. And as we further increase our depth of field, finally everything is in focus. We can see all the features. So this is like a landscape. In the first photo, we're only just focusing on our portrait of our statue in the foreground. But if you have a landscape, you want all of your foreground, middle ground, and background to be in focus. So you want a larger f-stop. So once more, because this is the thing that people get confused every year, I have included in this presentation in words what we're doing with f-stop. That a low number is isolating your thing in the foreground that you want to stand out and a large number is keeping everything in focus. Mm -hmm. So I've got some fun different things you can do. I've got photos that show examples of different techniques you can play around with your point and shoot camera and some photos I've taken over the years. So the first off, we're gonna look at time tricks. So these are playing around mostly with our shutter speed. So in the assignment at the end, when we talk about um, playing with time, here's how you do it. So the first picture I have of is my friend on a campsite and her arms are blurry. This was a slow shutter speed. So again, I was using my Nikon Coolpix. It automatically picked up that it was a very dark day. So it was later in the evening and the lighting was low, so my camera slowed down the shutter speed to allow more light in. And it was slow enough that her waving her arms became blurry, which is a really neat effect. If the shutter speed had been faster, her arms would have been in focus, but probably the whole scene would have been much darker. Here is a very fast shutter speed. So it was a really bright sunny day and the shutter speed is on sports setting on my point and shoot Nikon Coolpix. And you can see the, the waves of the water are frozen. So you can see in that the gentleman in the front, he has his paddle in the water and there's a splash with rivulets and drips on it. That's frozen in time, fast shutter speed. This is a pretty classic example of how you can play with your shutter speed. There are settings on your camera, even point and shoot settings often will have these slow down settings. Um, sometimes a firework setting is basically an extra slow shutter speed. Some cameras will let you just slow them right down completely. So water is clear. So if you take a picture of a waterfall with a fast shutter speed, a standard shutter speed, the water will look clear. But because water, the way water reflects light and it's moving, if you leave your shutter speed open for a little bit of time, you'll get this beautiful white flowy waterfall that you may have seen in different uh, photographs before takes a little bit of practice. I usually end up having to take five or six photos because I either overexpose my photo from leaving the shutter speed open too long or underexpose it. But it is a neat effect when you get the hang of it and you probably need a tripod so you don't or rest your camera on something so you're not moving your camera around so the rest of the scene is in focus. And then this is just a really fast shutter speed. So this is uh, borrowing a friend's camera and we used a really super fast shutter speed 
he took a photo of me doing a cannonball and floating basically above the water and you can see the little droplets landing um it's kind of a a neat trick you can do so the next thing i want to talk about is varying exposure so this is basically tricking your light meter and changing your shutter speed so i'm going to show you some tricks that i do not with an slr camera not actually adjusting my light meter but you can but I trick the icon into doing these things. So this one is what a picture looks like when it's overexposed. There's too much light. So this was on a really dark day and I originally had my camera when I made the settings, I had the camera pointing down at the ground. So on a dark day down at the ground, there was no light and the light meter is like, whoa, we're gonna have to like overexpose this photo to get leave the shutters open a long time to get the right light. But then when I set it up and put it on the timer, we were then uh, overexposed because I was taking this picture of myself. So I set my camera up, I put on a timer and it kept those settings from when I was pointed at the ground. I don't know why it did it that time because I've been not able to recreate this <laughs> effect, but this is over. This is also overexposed. So this is overexposed on purpose where it was a dark evening and these kids were playing with LED lights on strings. So I purposely left my shutter open and I used a setting on my Nikon Coolpix that allows you to leave your setting, your shutter open longer. But that could just be a firework setting if that's what you have. And it made the rest of the photo a lot darker. It wasn't um, or a lot brighter, I mean. It was a pretty late at night, dark night, but it allowed me to see the trails of those LED lights, which is pretty neat. And then here's one that's underexposed on purpose. Um, frequently when you have objects that are backlit, the camera recognizes the sun as its light exposure and the sun is bright. Therefore, it doesn't need to let in a ton of light. So the person in the foreground is underexposed because otherwise your background would just be pure light. If you wanna actually see the sun, you've gotta be um, underexposing that photo. So this is a really common problem when you have a backlit subject. So I could have taken this picture of Alexia here where she was well lit because it was still sunny out, but I would have had to move my camera away from the sun, so facing the other direction, and sort of half press down the uh, button that allows me to take the photo so that the camera takes those settings and remembers it. But I leave my finger on it, I bring it back, and then take finish pressing the button to get the actual photo taken. So a lot of the point and shoot cameras have this feature where if you sort of start to press the button, it takes the settings and if you press it all the way, then you get the actual picture taking. So it allows you to trick your camera and you can point at your hand or point it at the ground to change the light settings. This doesn't work when you're trying to focus on something. But when you have landscape settings where you're just assuming you're getting focus everything, this works quite well. This is another example where I had a backlit situation and I had to do just that, but it was a close up backlit. So instead of pointing away from the sun and then pointing to the sun, I had to put my hand in front of the moss so that my camera would focus on my hand and get that focusing depth right, as well as block my hand was blocking the sun. So then the light exposure was right. And then I take my hand away and take the picture so that I was focusing on the moss and not getting that overexposure from the light as well, or underexposure. So play around, 
with your camera and see what it can do. I love these like blue diamonds is just a feature of sometimes you get in cameras that reflection in the lens of the sun. I know this is down at the bottom, but we're gonna do flash next because it really connects to varying exposure. So the idea of flash is you're lighting up something that's dark. So these are stalagmites because stalactites hold on to the tightly to the ceiling. So stalagmites on the ground in a cave in Iceland and it was dark, pitch black. So I tried to take pictures of these stalagmites and couldn't see a thing. So then I had to put on a flash and with a flash, I could only see that first stalagmite and it was super overexposed. So then I got uh, the people I was with to shine their flashlights from different angles so that I had more light source. And then even with the flash, I still needed the flash, but I had a more depth of light by using more than one light source. So it's nice to try and use the tools that are available to you. But my favorite thing to play around with flashes is underexposing and overexposing when you have light sources. So if you try to take a picture of a fire without a flash, just like with Alexia and the sun set, sunset behind her, everything gets underexposed because your camera's like, whoa, fire, this is a lot of light. I need a short shutter speed. I don't need to let in very much light. So, but when you add a flash, then the camera realizes things are going to be lit and you'll get to see the whole photograph. So this is the exact same photo taken with and without a flash. So there's a lot of things you can do, and this is one of the ways to solve a backlit problem. Another neat way that you can use a flash is in settings where you have a low light, but um, reflective surfaces. So this is in Iceland again, where it was in the winter and the sun barely got over the horizon. So even though it was the middle of the day, it was like, felt like it was dawn dusk lighting. So with the flash on, cause I had my flash on because I was taking pictures in the cave. <laughs> when I came up above ground again, I forgot and my flash went off and I got this picture of this grass that's very well lit and nothing else is lit because my camera's focusing on the, the flash in the foreground. I took that same picture again without light and my camera didn't focus on the grass anymore. It focused on the surroundings and all of a sudden it's a totally different photograph. So with the flash, my camera focused on that grass in the foreground, which was overexposed and underexposed that background. But without my flash, my camera allowed the light from all over that landscape to come in and focused on that background and rather the foreground. And I have since played with this effect, but I've never, this is still my best example in terms of teaching you guys, but it is a fun thing to play with now that I know it exists. All right, filters. Filters are one of those things that existed in SLR cameras where you take off a whole lens and you put on a blue filter. So you take off your normal lens or you would put a blue filter screwed onto the end of your lens. So you'd still have your normal lens, but then you'd add a blue filter and all your photos would have a bit of a blue tinge. And I've noticed in a lot of point and shoot cameras, they have a feature called dawn or dusk. And that's basically just a blue filter where they add a blue tint to your photograph. There's also an orange filter. So this used to be a really common filter. I have for my old SLR camera, an orange filter that I used to be able to screw on the end of my lens to make a sunset appear more orange. And a lot of point and shoot cameras have this filter and it's called sunset. And it's not the same as a blue or red filter that you would put on the end of the lens, but it creates a very similar effect. One of the, my favorite things with new modern cameras is a lot of them have 
a color filter where you can choose to take photographs that only accept one color. And it is so much fun. So this is where I have, my camera has filtered out all the colors except green and only specific greens, not all the greens, but a specific shade of green. And I love playing around with this. Green in particular is a fun one. Red, because people's faces are red, is a fun one to play with. I like using blue a lot. Um, I work at a kid's camp where blue is the color of the camp. Um, so it really makes these black and white photos pop with that blue. Portrait photography. One of your assignments is to take a portrait. So I'll talk about how you can take a good portrait. And a lot of that is about taking the time, setting a scene, zooming in on your subject, making sure it is the focus of your portrait, that people's eyes aren't going to be distracted by things in the background. They're looking at your portrait. So I'll explain that a bit more. This is one of my favorite portraits of my friend, friend Emily. The, she is the topic of the photograph. There's nothing else in this photo, just her. She's taking up the majority of the screen. I haven't put her front and center because I personally really like the thirds rule where you divide the screen up into thirds. So I've offset her a little bit because I like photographs that are offset better than central. I like those uh, thirds photographs. She is in focus and nothing else is. My background is a little bit blurry, so that's a low numbered f-stop. I also have a background that's not distracting. It's as plain as I can get. And she is very well lit, so she's squinting into the sun. <laughs> um, I really like this portrait of her. But you can do it of anything. So you want to make your subject to be the whole frame. A lot of beginner photographers have the thing that they're taking is this tiny part of the photograph. Zoom in. Make the thing you're taking your picture the entire picture. Make sure the lighting's good. Take the time to place things. A friend of mine, I always say he will always be a better photographer than me because I look down and see that there are three canoes floating in the water and they look beautiful. And I take a photograph. End of story. He goes down and puts all the paddles so all the paddles are facing the same direction and changes the ropes so that all the ropes are aligned. And then he comes up and takes that same photograph and his looks better than mine. It always looks better than mine because he's taken the time. So take the time. Another big point is not to have a distracting background. So in the one with the bowls and cups, it's a very small color palette and there's nothing distracting in the background. So if you're taking a picture of a human and their laundry pile is in the background distracting you, that's no good, right? You want everything to be about whatever you're taking the picture of. So like try different things. I've got one of a cup and a bowl, like could be anything. This is my sister's dog, Winry. It's fun to be creative, try different things. So these are two of my friends and I just posed them in this spot. I thought this is hilarious and took a photograph. It's not the best photograph I've ever taken, but it is one of the few where I have physically posed people into a portrait. So speaking of which, we can play with our focus. So this is playing with your f-stop and on a point and shoot camera, this is using the settings like you'll have like a close-up macro flower setting or a wide angle landscape. So this is using that close-up macro flower setting. And I wanted to have that Viper's Blue Gloss in focus, but I also wanted it to be offset because I like that thirds rule that I was talking about. So you can do this in two ways. You can put the 
the flower in the middle and press half press your button so that your camera takes the setting and focuses with the flower in the middle and then shift your camera or you can put your hand and what I've been doing with my phone because I can't half take a picture with my phone is put my hand in front so it focuses on my hand and then I take my hand away and take the picture fast. And I purposely chose an angle to take this photo where I had blue and purple flowers in the background that were going to be blurred out and not to have the street or a fence in the background. I changed my angle so I controlled, I have a less distracting complementary background. Here's another example. This one, again, I had to put my hand because my camera just no matter what I did would not focus on the spider web. There's just, it's not substantial enough for my camera to recognize it. So I had to put my hand in front of the spider web and half press my button to focus it and then try to take the picture and had to wait. This is the last, literally the last canoe in the line of canoes in my group. And I made them stay as I wait, 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 okay, wait, wait, now paddle, <laughs> trying to get this photograph aligned properly. So it matters to take that time and think about things. So this is the opposite of focusing on the foreground. This is focusing on the background. So I stood, I held, I didn't stand up. I actually held the camera above me and half pressed. So it focused on uh, Gilby here and then I brought the camera down to the pavement and finished pressing. So because I had it set where it was focusing on Gilby in the middle ground or background then when I brought it down the foreground becomes blurry so I can get this effect of Gilby being the focus of the pho photograph even though he is not taking up the whole screen. So this is one of those few examples where I've put Gilby in the middle of the picture and he is not taking up the entire screen of the picture. Because my point that I was trying to make was having that blurred line meeting up. So Gilby is the very center of this photo. And that's going a little bit more into like the framing of the photo. But I thought about this. I thought about the framing of how the trees on one side and the telephone lines on the other and the the yellow line in the middle all met at Gilby. It and I didn't think about it in the moment. I thought of I did, like I thought about how it was cutting my screen in the quarters. It looked good. I knew that it looked good and I wanted that effect. But I didn't think about how well that was framed until I sat down and looked at it later. So this is what I'm looking for in one of your assignments is to have a beautiful scene where everything is in focus. You want a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. So this is my friend Kate in the Lake District and you can see the grass in the foreground is just as clear as Kate, as just as clear as those mountains in the background. That is a wide depth of field, a deep depth of field, depth of focus. So this is what I'm looking for. When you submit your photograph that's a beautiful scene, I don't want a sunset. I want something that shows a foreground, middle ground, and background all in focus. So a landscape setting on a point and shoot camera. If you have an SLR camera, you can change the lenses. If you don't, it's not a big deal but some of you might be able to actually physically change the lens and it totally changes the perspective of how you're seeing it. So for example, a fisheye lens changes how wide that angle is so you see in one photo more than you normally would. So it really changes the perspective of how you're looking. Peter Nosco took this photo and um, he did it standing on a stool with a flash to light us up and to make the rest of the background dark. This is with a macro lens. So most cameras now have macro settings. You don't actually need a separate lens. This is an older photograph of an aspen leaf, a large tooth aspen leaf with water drops. 
and this is a wide angle lens. So again, now a lot of cameras have these settings, but this is a separate lens so that you can take that wide angle of the sunset instead of a square. So last up, I want to talk about close up photography. One of the biggest mistakes brand new photographers make is not zooming in on their subject. You want to try and look at what your subject is from different angles, from different perspectives. And getting in closer, making that thing fill the screen changes how you look at things. So for example, a lot of mosses look very different up close and personal than they did from far away. I love taking close up pictures of moss. And from this one, I even got down and took an angle across, like I'm looking through a jungle of moss rather than down at the moss. I changed my angle as well as getting really close. Here's a picture of a pileated woodpecker through my window. So I got much closer to this bird than I normally would because this is how close I can look at a pileated woodpecker when I have my bird feeder attached to my window. And you can see the tree in the background is blurred out at focusing on that bird. But that's still not enough. You can really zoom in. This is a picture of some cinnamon rolls that we made over the campfire. And I've cut off, I've zoomed in so much you can't even see all of it. So typically you might take this photo where you can see the full pan, both there's two pans, and instead of showing you both full pans from far away, and then maybe having a bit of a table, I've zoomed right in so all you see is the cinnamon buns and you're not seeing the table they're sitting on or the ground they're sitting on or the person holding them. It's just the cinnamon buns. Same idea here. I could have taken a portrait where you could see, uh, this is one of my campers, so I don't want to say his name, but you could see his um, whole face or we can zoom right in and make his eye the focus of our picture for the day. Changes your perspective. So tips that you can use. So like I was saying, try different things, change your viewpoint, change your exposure, change your subjects, change your angle, change the shutter speed, change the light exposure. Take your time, like, Think about things. Come, think about what the photograph's going to look at. Take a 15 photos. Who cares? They're digital now. You're not paying for every single photograph anymore. Getting closer. That's a big one. Most people are zoomed out. Zoom in. Simplify your background. Think about your background. Everyone, we're thinking about the subject we're taking and we're not looking at what's behind you. And that's why we have so many great pictures on the internet of pictures of people peeing in the background of photos because people aren't looking <laughs> at the backgrounds of photos. You can take charge of that situation. You can move subjects. Peter, Peter Nosko once, when I was measuring uh, oak saplings, literally made me go and measure a different sapling so he could take a picture because that one was in better lighting. I didn't get to actually use the numbers, but he recognized that the photo would be better if I moved into the better lighting. So he took charge of the situation and moved me. And then I had to go back and actually measure the oak tree I was supposed to. But that's the same idea. Like, don't just be a passive part of that picture taking process. So this leads me to the assignment. So you need to take five original photos. One, a beautiful scene with deep focus. So this is a landscape. Like I said, not a sunset because sunsets rarely have a foreground, middle ground, background. Maybe you can take a sunset with those things, but I, I want there to be deep focus, foreground, middle ground, background. I want a plant or animal close up. So a portrait of a plant or animal. I also want a portrait of someone, a human, doing something environmental. To contra contrast that, I want a picture of some environmental damage. A picture paints a thousand words. Taking a photo of something that's environmentally damaging 
can sometimes have more of an impact than talking about it. And then lastly, I want you to try and take a photo where time has been altered. So playing with the shutter speeds. So like I showed you the photos of uh, someone floating in the air because they're jumping and you've taken that instant in time. Or someone's arms are blurry. Those light tricks. These are really fun to do with light in, in the dark. Uh, the pictures of stars and lights at night are also time altered photos. I have put this assignment up on Blackboard, so you should be able to see it on Blackboard and submit it on Blackboard. Maybe putting these five photographs into a PDF or a PowerPoint might be the best way to submit it. And if you have any questions, maybe send me an email or ask me in our synchronous session.